We don't want to make any partisan political statements concerning any election or any politician, any party, who to vote for, who not to vote for. Our aim is simply to look at contemporary world events, particularly in the Middle East and in Europe, in light of what the Word of God says, and to try to understand these events from a biblical perspective. These things are foretold in the Word of God, although there are some who foolishly and ignorantly deny it. Two issues facing us this very week, and that will be facing us for some time, are Barack Obama's treaty with Iran that was never approved by the Senate. He just did it by fiat and arbitrarily made it. And he did so with the help of Senator Corker, a Republican, who did not insist that it be approved by the Senate. Hence, with the assistance of Republicans, Barack Obama was able to force this through, even though nearly two-thirds of the American public didn't want it and don't trust Iran. The other issue is, of course, the Muslim refugees pouring into Europe and the American government, Barack Obama, wanting to bring at least 10,000 from Syria into the United States. What the scriptures tell us concerning these countries, such as Iran and Syria in the last days, and how do the contemporary events we see figure into the scenario prophetically that God gives us? The prophecy of Isaiah 17 was never totally fulfilled. The oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. For its long history, not simply centuries, but thousands of years. That prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus, Syria, has never been fulfilled. Never. It must still take place before or when Jesus comes. Now, we also have those who believe that there are two Gog and Magog conflicts. The obvious one at the end of the millennial reign of Christ in the book of Revelation, but some believe there'll be another one before that which foreshadow it, where we will see from the uttermost parts of the north, the area of the Scythians and the Hittites, the countries that in modern terms are Soviet Central Asia and Iran, coming down aligned with the nations that are today in the former Soviet Union, particularly Russia. <coughs> How many Christians believe this? Ezekiel 37, although it has a future meaning for the resurrection, obviously, with the flesh coming on the bones, is a picture of the rebirth of national Israel, and then what is going to follow it will be a Gog and Magog battle. Many people believe this. They may be entirely right. My own inclination is to believe that there is two battles of Gog and Magog, the final post-millennial one, but another one before it. I cannot be dogmatic about it, but it would seem to add up. Well, why is Russia having its own Islamic threat from Chechnya? Given what the Muslim fanatics and terrorists have done in Moscow at the theater and at the stadium, and shooting the Osishkin children in the back in Chechnya, what vested interest would Putin have in aligning himself with Iran and with Islamic countries. Russia has a birth rate crisis. Its population is aging and declining. The only sector of Russia that is growing demographically are Muslims. Islam represents an existential threat to Russian civilization. Yet Mr. Putin is aligning himself with the Alewa Muslims of Syria, that is the Assad regime, the Iranians, and with others. Why is he doing that? Well, Ezekiel says, I will put hooks in your jaws and pull you in. He's being set up for the judgment of God. It makes no strategic sense. He thought by causing stability in the Middle East, he could artificially drive up the price and value of Russian gas and oil. But that's not happening. 
It makes no sense economically or strategically, but he's doing it. And we have Russian troops arriving in Syria, 40 minutes drive from Galilee in Israel. I'll put hooks in your jaws and pull you in. What is happening with these so-called refugees from Syria, Iraq, caused by ISIS and the conflict with ISIS, and even from Afghanistan, pouring into Europe. We see that Angela Merkel wants to accept perhaps a half a million of them into Germany alone. Britain to take them, France to take them, countries that don't want to take them in Europe, such as Hungary, are being pressed by the big economies in Europe to do so. Again, as Daniel said, the iron does not stick to the clay. The dominant countries in Europe will bully the smaller and weaker ones. Why do these people want to come to Europe? Why does not the oil-rich countries of Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf, the Emirates, take them? Why does Kuwait refuse to take any? Why do Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Qatar refuse to take any? And above all, why does Saudi Arabia refuse to take any? Let them go to Europe. Let them go to America. We don't want our own kind. We don't want Muslim refugees. They may be terrorists from ISIS or Al-Qaeda, say the Saudis. Let them go to Europe. Yet the Saudi Arabian government is saying they're prepared to build 200 mosques in Germany to accommodate their religious needs. <laughs> Those will be Wahhabist mosques, fundamentalist mosques. Fundamentalist Wahhabism that generates support for militant Islam and for pro-Sharia radicalism that in turn engenders support for terror. This is how we got Al-Qaeda. It's not about taking refugees for humanitarian reasons. It's about spreading militant Islam funded by Saudi Arabia. Just give them visas the way Bush did. The way Clinton did. Let them in. Of the 57 Islamic countries in the world, I've said repeatedly, not one of these countries will give Christians and Jews the rights they get and demand in America, Britain, Australia, or Israel. They have rights we don't. And included in their rights are social benefits. Look at one country like Denmark, 4% Muslim population. Yet 40% of the people on the dole on welfare in Denmark are Muslim, even though they're only 4% of the population, 10 times higher than the national average. 70% of the convicted rapists in Danish prisons are Muslims. 90% of their victims are Danish, European. Nobody can deny these facts. What happened in Rotterdam, the murder of Theo van Gogh in Holland, the Bandler riots in Paris, the Canola riots in Sydney, the Bradford riots in England, but let more in. We're not talking about moderate Muslims, we're talking about fundamentalists. You see them with the beards, with the hajibs, the halabjas. You see them? What they believe in is demitude. The infidel, the Christian, has to pay a penalty to the Muslim for not being a Muslim. That's how they see welfare. That is how they see social benefits. That the Judeo-Christian nations should have to pay them, put them on welfare, because that's a penalty that their Allah has imposed on the infidel for not being a Muslim that should go to the Muslim. You should support us because that's what our religion teaches. You have to pay a penalty and support us in your country because that's what our religion teaches. And we have one political prostitute after another, one crooked politician after another acquiescing to it. The Bush family, the Bush administration, 
was virtually owned and operated by the Saudi Arabians. Barack Obama. Can you imagine they're holding four Americans captive, including a Christian pastor? Yet we make a treaty with them without the constitutional approval of the Senate? They're developing missiles and delivery systems that will not only be able to hit Tel Aviv, eventually hit North America, but let them have it. It's an open path for them to eventually develop a nuclear weapon. The next Islamic doctrine that our Western governments are ignoring is tahweed, permissible lying. The doctrine of tahweed, they say they believe in peace. When they speak to each other, they don't use the word salim, they use a different word in Arabic. They use a term hudna, a temporary ceasefire until we can get the strategic advantage to double cross the infidel and continue the jihad. They'll continue to develop those weapons. We can't even inspect them without 28 days notice and then the UN has to inspect them, not us. Thousands and thousands of Americans in Iraq and in Afghanistan and many British and European soldiers have been killed and left permanently handicapped, maimed, crippled by incendiary devices provided by Iran. Now the American government wants to release another $150 billion into the Iranian economy so they can kill more Americans. How do you explain this betrayal? How do you explain this insanity? At the very time our corrupt leaders in the White House are doing this, at the very time they're doing it, the Iranians are saying we're going to destroy Israel and death to America and holding an American pastor hostage. We see in the eyes of Islam, the way they look at it, Barack Obama and John Kerry are kneeling down in public, licking the boots of the Iranian mullahs. And John Boehner and Mitch McConnell are licking the boots of Obama. That's how the Iranians look at it. They openly say it. They mock us. How do we explain this insanity? It is God's judgment. Much the same as God used the Amalekites and the Philistines to judge Israel when they turned away from him. God is using Islam as a judgment on the Judeo-Christian world. Now, when God uses a heathen nation, and fundamentalist Islam is heathen, I do not say that there are not moderate Muslims who do not agree with jihad. There are. But the moderate Muslims themselves are the victims of the jihadists. It's God's judgment. Yet God will deal with those nations. He will deal with Iran. He will deal with Syria. He will deal with the Arab world. And he'll do it for two reasons. One is their persecution of Christians, the persecution of Arab and Iranian Christians is something God will avenge. And two is their hatred of Israel. God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And that includes our own corrupt leaders like the Bush family and Barack Obama. Daniel tells us, chapter 10, that Iran would become the existential threat to Israel's existence, the prince of Persia, a demonic power with whom the angel, archangel Michael contended would gain control of Iran in the last days of Persia. And it would become a satanic vehicle to try to destroy Israel in order to prevent the return of Christ. It won't work, but Satan is desperate. And he has plenty of people in his employ working in such places as the White House and the British Parliament. That's what's really happening. Our own leaders have gone mad. They've turned away from the Judeo-Christian scriptures and everything from sexual morality to dealing with 
religious philosophies that are inimical to our freedom and existence. Hillary Clinton opened the door to Iran. Look at the result. What will the result be? The result is going to be what Daniel 10 says concerning Iran. The result is going to be what Isaiah 17 says concerning Syria. We know what the result is going to be. Jesus made it clear three times in the New Testament directly. The Jews would have to return to Israel. In order for him to return, they'd have to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. As I've said many times, Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat, and it's where he will get his final defeat. He will try desperately to remove the Jews from Israel, and especially from Jerusalem. And he will attempt to use Islam, he will attempt to use corrupt politicians in the American and European governments, but he will not succeed. Ultimately, Christ prevails. Nonetheless, we see what's happening. These refugees are not refugees. If they were refugees, they can go to Muslim countries who have their same religion, culture, and language. They're invaders because their own countries don't want to accept them. Other Muslims don't want them. The Saudi Arabians want them to come to America so the American taxpayer can support them. The only contribution you're going to get from the Saudi Arabians is to build mosques that teach Wahhabism and madrasas that teach Wahhabism. Jihadist Islam, promoting Sharia in America and Europe to destroy our democracy, freedom, and identity. And our corrupt leaders are rolling out the carpet for them to do it. We are under the judgment of God. But God's judgment is going to come. I pray that God's judgment falls on the Clintons and on the Bush family and on Obama. I pray the judgment of God falls on them rather than falls on America because of them. But I know that when George Bush took a Koran, a book that says God has no son, and George Bush put it in the White House to honor Islam after September 11th. He made himself the enemy of God. God does have a son. The Koran lies, and so does the Bush family. It's not a religion of peace and tolerance. Not one of those 57 countries is either peaceful or tolerant. There are more than three times as many conflicts in today's world involving Islam than there are all of the other religio people groups put together. Among the biggest victims are the moderate Muslims who don't agree with jihadism, radicalism, terror, enforced sharia. Refugees. They're not refugees. They're invaders. If they were real refugees, they could go to Saudi Arabia, but the Saudis don't want them in. They could go to the oil-rich emirates, but they don't want them either. They don't want to take care of them. They want the American and European taxpayer to take care of them because that's the demi. And the political whores we have for leaders are more than happy to take your money and mine and do it. This is God's judgment. That's his judgment on us. But make no mistake about it. Read Daniel 10. Read Isaiah 17. God's judgment on the Islamic world is surely coming. And the stage may be being set as we speak for an eventual Gog and Magog. Of this, I cannot be 100% certain at present. But concerning Isaiah 17 and Daniel 10, there can be no question. These events fulfill prophecy. They are all of prophetic significance. Satan is on the march. But praise God, so is Jesus. 
My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you.